Okay, this is the Lessons of the 60s, a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. Today we're interviewing Sally Benson. My name, the interviewer, is Ann Gallivan. Uh, our videographer is Eddie Becker. Today's date is May 12, 2017, and we are shooting here at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. Sally Benson was and is a peace activist and spent a couple of years in Vietnam after college. Returning to the United States while the war was still raging, Sally and others founded an important organization called the Indochina Mobile Education Project, or IMEP, that educated Americans about certain aspects of the Vietnam War. IMEP played an important role in bringing peace after the signing of the peace agreement in 1973. Along with Indochina Peace Campaign, IMEP and others forced the U.S. Congress to stop funding the war and that the war ended on April 30, 1975. Sally, tell us a little bit about your life um, and particularly what motivated you to go to Southeast Asia for a couple of years in the 60s and then when and how you settled back in Washington, D.C. So what's your background? What motivated you to do these things? Well, I, and I grew up um, in a couple of small towns in western Massachusetts. I, uh, I don't know, uh, except that I, I had a couple of older aunts, great aunts, who had done some, had traveled or d done some international work. And I think as a child I was impressed by both their commitments and their independence as women. They were single women. Mm -hmm. um, and I was active in scouts and 4-H and my church youth group. A good and, citizen. You were a good citizen. Yeah, and my parents were that kind of people. Yes. They were involved in, in the local community. They did not un pay attention much to national politics. They, my father would say, oh, the big boys in Washington know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I went, um, I, I went to Bates College in Maine and was a religion major and I was very interested at the time in the ecumenical movement that was building and I took off from straight from college. I used to say I didn't want to be everybody's bridesmaid. So I left and went, <laughs> took a boat, a boat, fourth class to, to, well, I thought I was going to Okinawa. I ended up on the island of Ishigaki way to the south working on a building a road and I was the only uh, non-Japanese speaking person in this road crew and then I became quite uh, and I thought I was quite enamored with Asia and and uh, I came back and I taught second grade in West Bridgewater Massachusetts and uh, anyway went back and forth. I would teach in order to earn the money to go back, you know, so I did that a couple of times. And was then this with International Voluntary Service yet? It was with something called Ecumenical Voluntary okay. Service. It was, so it was a structured thing. A little structured thing, yeah, yeah. Very small, didn't last, it didn't, you know, once the Peace Corps started, you know, those little things, I think, evaporated. But in any case, I, um, I decided that I was going to, you know, I, I would be single, and I would, uh, I, w I was a teacher, and I wanted a career in education in Asia. So I saw on television in Boston an ad for teachers and nurses to go to Vietnam for USAID. Now, what year would this have been? Well, this was the fall of '66, and so I. Uh, I called the number, and this guy named Dr. Hammond said, "Oh, well, c come for an interview." I came down for an interview. All you know, I had my my pump, my black dress, my gloves, <laughs> and I walked. I remember the the narrow, dark hallways of USAID and meeting Dr. Hammond. I, he didn't even invite me to sit down. He said, "Oh, we have a place for kids like you." <laughs> And he sent, he sent me to IVS, International Voluntary Services. I was so mad. Why were you mad? Well, because I was ready for a career and I'm being able to support myself with a job. And I, uh, 
IVS was in the Anchorage building, and I remember going and I went across the street to the Janus Theater and went to the movie, a movie, <laughs> I don't know what it was, and then sort of, am I really going to do this? And I went in, and of course there were all these really great young people with posters on, you know, it was a completely different atmosphere than USAID. IVS, you talked about. But am I going to work again for $80 a month, you know, working, teaching six days a week? I mean, really, i beginning to worry about my future. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, um, I ended up going to the orientation and uh, there was a guy sitting next to me who was terrified. He, he said, I'm afraid of guns and I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to Vietnam. I'm afraid of guns. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And I got up and left and went into the parlor car. And there was this hulking guy sitting there like this. And he says, I've been in Tanganyika. I've just come from Tanganyika and now I'm going to Laos. I don't know where Laos is. And it was Fred Brampton. Fred Brampton, the great Fred Brampton. And so we, there was a bond right there. Yes. Um, tell, tell, tell us who Fred Brampton was and who he became. Well, he, he then went on to Laos as an IVS volunteer. I was told I couldn't go because I didn't have a security clearance. Mm -hmm. What? I don't have a security clearance. A sweet little girl from Massachusetts, you know. With, yeah. um, so uh, basically, I, I'll tell you about Fred in a minute. But he said, "You, you go home, and when you have your security clearance, um, I, you know, I didn't have a home. I went back to my folks, mm -hmm. and uh, and I decided I better go look for a job in California." So off I went, and uh, then I got the phone call, you've got a security clearance. And so I guess in that phone call, I understood that I could fly to Asia right then. I didn't have to wait for the next group. Mm -hmm. So okay, I flew to Asia again, <laughs> went to Okinawa, saw the people I had worked with before, went to Hong Kong, hung out, and waited for the next IVS team to show up in early June. Mm -hmm. And got on the plane and at the Tonsonet Airport in Saigon, you know, Steve Nichols was this other volunteer and we, you know, the, we never have forgotten that the ceiling was open to the sky because of mortar attacks, mm. recent mortar attacks. That was your, that was your welcome to Vietnam. <laughs> right, it was. Um, we went on to um, uh, uh, some training and whatever, t the same training, and um, very quickly Steve started getting draft notices from Riverside County, California. and. Uh, he would write back and say, but I am in the war zone, I am doing this, I'm doing that, I am teaching this. And then he would get another letter that would come, not by air, it must have gone by sea or something. By the time it would reach him, it would say, uh, if, you know, if you can't report to the Indio bus station two weeks earlier, <laughs> mm -hmm. then go to your nearest um, draft. Your nearest, what do you call it? Draft board. Draft board, right? Draft board, draft, you know, induction center. Oh. Induction center. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this went on. Repeated draft. We notices. should mention here that Steve Nichols later became your husband. Right? He wasn't just another volunteer. <laughs> well, you get the idea that we're together, yes. And so, um, yeah. but in the, you know, it was quite a fall. I mean, it was, uh, I'll never forget that I was invited. I, being a, what they called a round eye, uh, a young American woman in Saigon in those, I mean, you know, it, it was very visible 
both to the Vietnamese and to the Americans. And so I was invited by some people with JustPal, the joint U.S. I don't know, the propaganda organization, to lunch at the time of the election. And uh, I can remember these guys, you know, were drinking and standing up on chairs, and we did it, we did it, we did it. I'm so naive. I said, what do you mean you did it? What did you do? Well, we got two elected. Oh, oh and you got two. Said, oh. um, and this would have been 67? Six, the fall of 67, and you know who ran against him? was um, um, the man, you'll hear more about David Trung yes. later, but his father, David who Trung's was then father. put immediately into prison yes. for having done, even in a rigged election, he got a very huge percentage. Well, so then there was the Tet Offensive. Right. Tell us about uh, your day at the Tet Offensive. What was that the like? The days? The days. <laughs> well, um, the schools were closed, so every, you know, and more or less everything shuts down. It's, Tet is a big, big holiday. And uh, a couple of interesting things happened. One was I was invited to dinner by a man who said he was my boss. I'd never seen him before. I'd never heard about him before. I'd, I don't now remember his name. We went to dinner and there was, you know, firecrackers, fireworks going and uh, and I remember commenting that um, we were at the flower market, which is a whole street downtown Saigon. Um, and I remember saying, how do you know that, how can you tell the difference between this sound and, you know, um, military stuff? I remember this guy was really depressed. I mean, he looked like he was, he was more, shut down or dumbfounded than I was. Is a Vietnamese person or an American person? He's an American. American. He probably, I don't know what he was. He said he had an office in my school. I'd never seen him before. I've never seen him since. Never saw him again. But Steve was also, um, had vacation. So he, I had a room, just one little room in a slum. Uh, it was called the checkerboard area. And it was called the Harlem of Saigon. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten this room because it was right across the huge boulevard um, from my school. I could just, I thought I could just walk across the street, but this big boulevard often had convoys, you know, it took me sometimes a long time to get to school. But, so Steve was there, and um, that, the next morning, we think we're going to go make a visit, which we do at Tet time to a particular Vietnamese friend, and then we were going to go to the zoo. So we, my landlady stopped us at the door. No, 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 no. And that afternoon, her son appeared in my room, completely shaken, um, because his house had just been uh, bombed not far away. Right. And that night was a night of some horror. Um, I don't have to go into the detail, and we realized that we better get out of here because, uh, you know, the police control, you know, we're supposed to know exactly who was in any, any living quarters, how many people, if there were anybody missing or anybody extra, and that we should, for the safety of my landlady, um, this old ba, um, which is a Vietnamese word for adult woman or older woman, mm -hmm. we would, um, but the night before, I mean, through the slats, through the shutters, I didn't have any windows, the shutters, you know, there were troops going this way, troops, feet going that way, I mean, and it was total silence. Total, total so the city silence. must have been very tense. Well, it was uh, what we didn't know was already under attack. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so there was a or there was a building which we didn't know anything about. It was called the Free World. Uh, so a high rise building across the street next to my school. What's the Free World? So Steve decides he's going to go over and see if we can't, you know, hang out there. And um, uh, 
he tells this guy, Colonel Dunn, you know, that he, his girlfriend is across the street. Well, no American would be living across the street. It must be a prostitute, a Vietnamese prostitute. And Colonel Dunn is not too sure about this. Um, but anyway, Steve comes back to get me, and I, there's no vehicles anywhere, but there are bodies, I mean, bodies in the boulevard. And uh, he, you know, we cross and we go, and meanwhile, I had been frying up some chicken. I didn't have a refrigerator, but I had one little plug-in fry pan, frying up chicken. And um, so I'm thinking, well, carry, you know, carrying that. Colonel Dunn is standing on the, <laughs> on the steps of the free world. And he, you know, here I am in my mini skirt, you know, trot, trot, trot. And <laughs> he, well, he has to check my bag. And he reaches in, and of course there's this chicken, <laughs> fried chicken. <laughs> well, to make this, the free world, so that you walked in and there was this Colonel Dunn's office and then some poor hapless sweet lieutenant who couldn't, didn't know what was going on any more than I did. And then on the other side were the Filipinos and there was a Thai office. There were, there were all the, um, what Bush later called the, what, Coalition of the Willing or something. Mm -hmm. But these were the people that were with the Americans and, and uh, the Koreans and... Right. Um, the Allies, you mean the, their Allies. The, so the Allies. Anyway, mm -hmm. the Australians left, the Koreans left, they were all heading to the field and there were just, you know, one or two people in each of these offices. And Colonel Dunn would leave by escort every night, and every night inviting me to go with him. I have showers, I have scotch, I have... <laughs> and what are you doing with a kid like this? Meaning Steve. It was bizarre, <laughs> totally bizarre. And we ended up befriending the Vietnamese lieutenant uh, who was in charge of security. And I'll say one more thing about our time in this, uh, at the time of all these attacks in the neighborhood. Um, we could say more, but in the morning, Lieutenant Colonel Dunn would give us the update, you know, what the, what the situation was, what the security was, what was happening in the neighborhood. And then Lieutenant Sa, the Vietnamese guy, would tell us, and Colonel Dunn was always a, a day late. His intelligence was always a day behind <laughs> the Vietnamese. Anyway, that was Ted. Well, Sally, I want to ask Let you one question. Let me just adjust this, Mike, because it's rubbing on your clothes. What? This. Oh, okay. So soon after that, uh, Steve is told, oh, meanwhile, we're not getting to Washington yet, but meanwhile, three IVSers are taken prisoner. Uh, a couple have been killed, but three are taken prisoner. By? And one of them was a woman, by the, by the North Vietnamese. Oh. So wh what happened was the North Vietnamese didn't know who IVSers were, or what we were about. I mean, they, they would think any Westerner would be military or CIA or something. But the, um, in the villages where IVSers served as ag workers or community organizers, they understood, you know, what we were, who we were, what we were about. So one of, the, one of them was a woman who I had convinced to change places with me. I wanted to be, anyway, she agreed to take my referral and then she ends up being taken prisoner. And I, it was, it was a weird time. Before we Because we hear this news on BBC. Before we leave the Tet Offense, I want to ask you, did you and Steve know at the time or only afterwards what was happening, that it was Oh, quickly offense? we knew. You knew, you. And you, yeah. Oh, you had a shortwave radio or something. We would hear BBC. You would not hear anything from Armed Forces Radio. Yeah, that's why I was asking. No, you I, wouldn't. So you um, knew at the time that there was a no. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. we heard. That's how we heard our yes. fellow IBSers were taken prisoner and um, walked to Hanoi from the south. And um, anyway, soon after that. Uh, IVS said they, whatever, 
for 10 years, anybody with a draft notice, they were able to fix it? Mm -hmm. See, they could Alternate service, basically, right? That was what it usually is. Yeah, so yeah. this Riverside, but the ultimate decision is always the local draft board. Anyway, so they put him on a plane and he went to LA and I didn't know where he'd gone. What had happened? I mean, there's no way to communicate. You know, there was no, um, it was quite a while before I knew he'd been put on a plane for Los Angeles, where, as you heard, he refused induction. Now, before we get you and Steve back to Washington, D.C., I want to back up a little bit and have you talk a little bit about Fred Brampman, who... Well, I didn't see him again uh, for years, um, but this really jumps ahead to Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, but he was in Laos. He was in Laos. He went to Laos and he As experienced an a U.S. bombing uh, in Laos. He didn't experience so much as there was a period when he, he had heard, and he had heard from Lou Wolf. Actually, Lou Wolf was on his way out, and Lou Wolf Laos. said, Check, yeah, you, you, there, there's this thing about bombing, and Lou had gone to the North Vietnamese Embassy in Vientiane. Um, Laos was, was uh, what's the word, Neut not neutral, oh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, the Vietnamese told Lou about this bombing. Lou told Fred, and when Fred was able to, he went up into the area, and, but he also interviewed refugees who yes. were telling about the bombing. Well, Fred, Fred became quite well known and, and a significant person in the anti war movement when he came out with a book, and I can't remember the year of it, but it was called Voices from the Plain of Jars, which mm -hmm. was the victims of the heavy bombing. Mm -hmm. um, that must have been the really most sad. Bombed, the most bombed country. Yes, and they're ever. still working to get oh, unexploited ordnance out of there, right? They're still and, good finding ordnance from World War I and World War II in Europe. So yes, Laos, it'll be forever. Um, so coming to, so, so Steve is convicted. Um, in California. In California. And it was interesting because the judge had been giving three and a half year prison sentences. And a girlfriend of mine <laughs> thought, well, he's going to go to prison. She gives me a dog, a mutt you know, to keep me company while Steve's in prison. But it turned out the judge couldn't quite believe that Steve had a two-year commitment to work in the war zone for virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but he had still broken the law. So he gave him a three-year probation sentence. And Steve said, well, and, and you have to go back to Vietnam and do what you were doing before. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Well, by this time, Steve wasn't too sure about going back to Vietnam. and. He said, well, I, I'm going to have to go to Washington and talk to IVS, yes. the IVS office. And so we drove across country. We had our little book that, you know, 20, 20 wild mushrooms that and how to cook them and how to grind acorns and make, uh, you know, and we had our sleeping bag and our dog and we had um, cartons of dispatch news service yes. materials, files, and we we, oh, somebody had given Steve an old, a Corvair, a Cor, um, what do you call Corvette? It? No, no, no. The Nader, you know. Un Corvette? Unsafe. Uh, the unsafe at any oh, speed. Oh, unsafe at any speed, right. And we had cinder blocks in the front of it to hold it down, and anyway, we, we drove across country, and, you know, the, uh, Campfires gave way to diners. <laughs> so you were on your way from wa from California to Washington D.C. To Washington D.C. Okay. and then um, this would have been IBS, '69 by then, right? Yes, this this or is '69 um, or late '68. Six no, it took a while. The a whole process of the courts and everything. No, it was '69. So. Um, uh, What do I want to say about that? Heading to D.C. 
We're heading for Washington. And so IVS by this time, I mean, more and more IVSers, the war is going crazier and crazier and more and more IVSers are, are um, speaking out. Plus a number had been withdrawn after the Tet Offensive. And then there was a May Offensive, I didn't mention that. And then there was an August Offensive. And it was after that that I actually, I, I began to be really uncomfortable with my, I realized, I realized what Steve understood from day one, that we were part of the war effort. You know, we were the good, healthy young people to yeah. show how good Americans are, you know, con contrasting with the, whatever the military was doing. And I, bec I was getting... Uh, That's a pretty important revelation, self-revelation, yes, that you're, you're, while you're trying to do some good, in, in a particular place, you're really being used by yeah. your government to, to look good. Absolutely, absolutely. Like the Peace Corps people were that a lot of a lot of that too. But so uh, and Steve never came back. So I I had headed for Los Angeles. Um, but in any case, we IVSers have been being brought back anyway. So then he was told he should go go to Vista or Peace Corps and. You know, so he goes to their office. They say, well, you're a convicted felon. We can't hire you. <laughs> and he's reporting this to the draft, um, his, what do you call it? His counselor, his yes. probation officer. Probation officer, thank you. Yeah, so, um, the, and by this time, the probation officers are getting, you know, there are more and more cases to deal with. And I, he dressed the Steve's, you know, on the up and up and, and so, um, this is a long story how this happened, but he ended up as a janitor at the International Student House at 1322 R Street. Mm -hmm. And I then ended up becoming the, and for $50 a month, mm -hmm. <laughs> he got a cot and he got meals. And um, I became sort of the program staff person and then but he, one thing, Steve was, it's, people were coming back and, you know, uh, people were staying with me on Q Street, 17th and Q, and um, this was happening with other people too. And finally one person, Dick Berliner, saw this house for sale on S Street. It had been abandoned for two years, had broken windows and, you know, it was, and said, well, let's all do this. You know, we each beg borrowed $1,300 mm -hmm. and bought this house. How many of you were? The there were five. There were going to be six. And Gene Stolzfus ended up loaning us $500 to make the town yeah. payment. Um, so five of you bought this house? Five of us for 1300 each. And, and, uh, and, and, and tell me what day, uh, what day did you buy this house? Yeah. Well, the papers are actually signed on May, May Day. May Day of 1971. 1971. Absolutely, the, the big May Day demonstrations. Perfect beginning for your career in Washington. <laughs> so, so that day you signed your papers and then you went over there at some point, right? Well, we, Steve got word that there had been an, an announcement that there'd be a meeting at 1744 S Street. Then the announcement was made to May Day participants on the on mall. On the mall. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so he, he knew that three of the four toilets, you know, didn't work at all. There was no electricity, and so he, the janitor at the student house, so he goes over to, you know, to try to unplug toilets or do something. To, and, and of course, all these bodies and <laughs> sleeping bags in the dark. You all know, these think people sleeping must there. Be, must be a spook, you know coming through with his. But these were all people who heard the announcement on the yeah. mall that there was, a, there was a place to crash, apparently, right? Yeah, I guess. Or a meeting. Was, it was to be a meeting, but they were crashed. And, uh, and so, and the neighborhood at the time was a lot of older professional, black professionals from, uh -huh. you know, Howard professors, dentists. Yeah. Um, that particular house, we came to understand, had been the home of the very famous civil rights lawyer, Charles Houston. Charles Houston was one of the people who lived there. Right? Well, he owned the house. And he died in the 50s. Um, 
while working while while leading the Brown versus Board of Education case. Mm -hmm. And his assistant was Thurgood Marshall, who then picked up the case. So his family, the house had been divided up during the Depression for family members. So there was a little quasi-kitchen on the third floor, a little quasi-kitchen. I mean, it was a great place for a group house, right? Um, so the first thing we did was have a ho housewarming. And uh, um, uh, we invited everybody we knew, including the banker and the real estate agent. And I have two memories from that night. I mean, first of all, it was very dark and cluttered with this family stuff that had been left because the house had been left for two years. It was quite sad, actually. Um, uh, but I have two memories. One is at the bottom of the stairs leading to the basement, which where the original kitchens were of these townhouses, and laundry room and coal room and in the front room had been Charles's home office, Charles Houston's home office. So on the landing is a beer keg. And so the banker and the real estate guy, um, and it's had to do with, I forget the name of the bank, it was the Black Controlled Bank. Independence? I mean, Independence Federal. Yeah. And uh, I mean, nobody else would have loaned. Four of us had no income. And John Schaefer mm -hmm. had an income of 7000 a year. Mm -hmm. Basis on his income, we got this loan. And, the, and Vogel, the guy from Vogel, I can't remember his name, a really sweet man. And he, so the banker saying, you know, we would formed a partnership, a legal partnership. Signed all these papers. And uh, so the banker says, well, this partnership's never going to, they're never going to profit, they're never going to get anything, for, and there's no profit, that's what you form a partnership for. Mm -hmm. And I remember overhearing the real estate guy uh, said, oh yeah, but they're profit and love. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> he got it, he much, understood. How much was it, the cost of that, do you remember? 26000 That probably seems so much at the time, right? Oh, yeah. It was like, how are we going to do this? Yes. You know, the other wild thing is, I mean, we were all we had never imagined owning property at that stage. And uh -huh. so I remember signing the lease. You know, we, we, <laughs> we thought in such short periods of time, signing a lease for 20 years, mm -hmm. I mean, whoa. If, you mean a loan? Yeah, a lo for a bank loan. Yeah, You're a right. bank loan. Right, a yeah. mortgage. 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 Well. So anyway, it's... So the other memory is Fred. Fred Brennan? Fred, Fred had one night on 17th and Q Street. I came home from work. I had no furniture, basically no furniture. And there was a phone on the floor. And Steve, th those are the days when people were getting rid of those big box televisions. Yeah. And Steve would drag in a television uh, thinking he, he might fix it. But anyway, they were, the, you know, we would use it as a chair. <laughs> And I, I hear this noise, and this is the third floor. I walk in, and there is Fred. I hadn't seen him since uh, February of 67. This and he's is sleeping nine. on your floor now. No, he's lying on the floor, because there's nothing, you know, and he's playing loud tapes to somebody on the hill. And he's got this tape recorder going, wow, oh, well, you know, t talking about the bombing. That was... That. Well, Steve, meanwhile, had, had a dark room. He set up a dark room in the basement of an AFSC-owned building. Not the Davis House, but another building. Um, and he did, he developed pictures for Dispatch News Service and for, and for Project Air War. But that night of our party, um, Fred met Twa. His wife who became his wife. And uh, they became the sort of the anchors for the Indochina Resource Center. Right. And the Indochina, Jean Stolzis had been um, sort of the inspiration and the organizer for the Indochina Resource Center. And there were two projects. One was Project Air War. He, he, and he had gotten support from the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterians, United Methodist Church, offices on Capitol Hill. 
and formed this organization. So there was Project Air War, and then there was the Indochina Mobile Education Project. So let's jump ahead to the Indochina Mobile Education Project. They, they, you're talking about um, a building at 1322 18th Street that was just filled for years during the war and after the war with anti-war organizations, uh, various things. Um, but Sally was the I person... I often wonder how that happened. Yeah, well, I, I mean, wonder later I wondered, oh, did the... Well, did however, the owner of that building, what deal did he get? However, to, to however it happened, it was it was a it was fortuitous because pretty much everybody who worked against the war ended up being in that building one way or the other. Different organizations and Fred and Twa always had the six o'clock news on in their apartment in that same building. And lots of us who worked in, on the anti-war movement would go up and watch the six o'clock news with them, which was all about Vietnam and the war. Right. So it was a hangout of sorts besides a working building. But you were very um, prominent in Washington, D.C. with Indochina Mobile Education Project. So can you tell us a little bit about IMAP? Uh, what was the purpose? Who founded it? Um, what was its purpose? And what did you do specifically with IMAP? Well, um, yeah, G Jean was really... Jean Stolfus. Jean Stolfus, who then at some point decided to go back to Indiana and go to Mennonite Seminary. Yes. And, uh, but he it, founded it. He had a lot to do with it. And Don Luce, who had, had taken uh, two congressmen, and Tom Harkin, who was his, one of the aides at the time, into the, the tiger cages. He had a secret little map that a student had well, been released. Well, tell people what the tiger cages were. The, um, the Kunshan Island prison, uh, notorious. The French had developed this, and then the Americans and the Saigon government had used it and built it, built it up and used it. Um, it was a horror. But in any case, um, uh, these two, they, they were supposed to go to the prison and see, you know, the recreation room and the dining room and however decent it was. But Don uh, knew from somebody had t told him that somebody had been released about a secret passageway and he went and banged on the door and spoke in Vietnamese. He'd been in Vietnam over 10 years. I mean, this Vietnamese was never great, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty solid. <laughs> and, you know, the poor, poor guy on the other side opened the door. And that's when Harkin took all those pictures that ended up in Life magazine. Right. Well, then the Saigon government expelled Don, and he was never allowed back. So um, how does IMAP relate to all this now? So, uh, his student friends, dissident friends, uh, activist friends, said, when you go home, tell the American people that we're people. You know, we're actually, we're people that you're bombing. And uh, so the idea was to have exhibits. There were, and Mac Turner was the, the, I don't know if you remember him, but he was the genius who put together these 20 panels, double-sided, so 40, in a sense, 40 panels with pictures of the landscape, of, of the people, the various tribes who lived in the uplands, who lived Indian. in the lowlands, who, lived, who were the fishermen, um, and uh, things about the culture, the Vietnamese, old, old Vietnamese culture. And uh, uh, the idea uh, then, you know, then how we would show the horrendous uh, impact of the war on the land, on the people, on the culture, the society. And then the ultimate goal was to say, in addition, you know, the people of Vietnam and Laos, um, but especially Vietnam, who were resisting the American presence in the American war were being imprisoned. There were 200, over 200,000 political prisoners in the Saigon prisons with a lot of funding from the U.S., a lot of training, police training and uh, military training mm -hmm. and equipment. 
um, by U U.S. taxpayers. So the idea was to travel town to town, city to city, uh, and many times campuses, and get people to write to Congress and say, you know, this is what our our guys are dying for. This is what our tax, tax money is going, going for. for. It's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Senator Byrd, I mean, he just of West Virginia. He he couldn't believe the letters that were coming in from all over his state. <laughs> because you'd been there with your van and you used pictures, right? Several times. I mean, several times. Many these van. There were two vans, and every. They went to every state except for Hawaii and Alaska, and there were some places where they went several times, or I mean a couple of times, and West Virginia was one of them. And your job was to set up these meetings. Uh, you took calls from ministers and mayors and colleges, and who else, who else invited the vans to come? Well, or we reached out to, to find, and, or you, the, um, yeah, there were organizations like chaplains organizations or the American Friends Service Committee or um, rotaries, I mean, you know. Civic organizations. Civic organizations, that, that wanted student to. organizations. And so that's, that, was, that was my day. And then in addition to that, and everybody, every, each van had two people. And each of the two people were people who had lived in, didn't just talk about things, but they had lived and experienced and witnessed. Um, and so, speaking of West Virginia, Bob Chenoweth was one of those. Um, About how many people totally did you have, that, th those kind of people who lived there on staff? I mean, how many people were there for all these four years that it was that uh, Well, they, they, they would go out on the road, some of them for a, a semester, some for a year, some for two or three years, and they made a hundred and I think $125 a month, $150 a month, mm -hmm. and you would depend on local organizers for food and bedding. And um, I don't know how many, and I'll tell you... It must have been a bunch by the end of it. It was a lot. It was it, a lot of different teams did this. And uh, after the war ended, uh, my office was firebombed, and I, after the war ended, and without having any budget, any money, I had gotten cardboard file drawers to, to put all the stuff, all the newspaper articles, all the personnel files, everything. Two long... This was 1322 18th Street, 1322 right? 1322 18th Street to, to free up the, the old metal file cabinets for mm -hmm. other things that we were doing, other things that were going on. And the office was firebombed. Um, and the closet that these things were in were inside the door. And the, um, so uh, speaking of IMEP, I mean, uh, this is an example of. Oh, well, that's one of the photos. This, uh, a photo. I mean, very few survived because uh, these things got lost or burned or something. This was taken after the, Bach the um, Christmas bombing. Oh, Hanoi. Uh, the uh, hospital, so, um, this is, you know, there would be sayings, there would be art pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And the Mobile Project published uh, various, uh, yes, a lot of it was, well, this is poetry. This, the artist of this was a, was a political prisoner uh, himself. You, you probably have seen mm -hmm. a number of these pictures because the movement used used them. Once we put them out there, of course, anybody could use them. And then this was published by the Mobile Project. Hostages um, of War. Hostages of War, Don Lee. Uh, Holmes Brown. And this is documentation of the, um, oh, yeah. the prison situation. And you can see, I mean, when the office was bombed, firebombed or whatever you call it, you know, whatever we could scrounge, we brought back to the house on mm -hmm. S Street. But you can see the char, a little bit of char. I mean, some mm -hmm. of it was, a lot of it was just burned. But this, you can just see the effect of... 
And the, the, one of the people that traveled with the mobile project was Jean-Pierre Debris. Mm -hmm. He was a, a young French teacher who, I guess the French had an alternative to the military service of teaching in the former colonies, the French high schools. So he and another guy uh, had that role and they, um, at some point, uh, posed a little demonstration in downtown Saigon. They climbed up on <laughs> the ugliest military statue you can possibly imagine and, and put out, threw off leaflets and they were stoned and dragged away and Ed Allen, who was with the Committee of Responsibility, Committee of Responsibility took um, children who were deformed from napalm to, ha to get reconstruction mm -hmm. surgery. Um, Twa worked with, had worked with that, but she came with some of those children. That's how she came to the States. Mm -hmm. But in any case, Ed Allen witnessed that scene and um, was sure that those guys would never survive. Yeah. So they were the only uh, foreign, non-Vietnamese political prisoners in the Saigon prisons, and could, and when they were finally released, um, they were ready to testify what they what they knew and what they saw. So Jean Pierre um, ended up traveling with the Mobile Project for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and speaking of, I mean, part of my job was in addition to all this organizing was, you know, to be the sounding board for these poor teens that were out on the road, you know. And what uh, was that like? What kind of questions would come up with what? Well, there were all kinds of things. I mean, like in Augusta, Georgia, uh, uh, Don and Jackie were really badly harassed by the, some KKK members. Oh, really? Uh, uh, Jean-Pierre would, uh, well, Bob Minnick, I mean, not Bob Minnick, Bob Chenoa called and he said, I am not going to have one more tofu dinner. <laughs> and it's Thanksgiving and I'm going to have turkey. You make sure I have Thanksgiving dinner with a turkey. <laughs> so I think it was Pittsburgh. He got his turkey. And he also got a girlfriend, Barbara. Barbara Sapin. That he later married. But um, uh, Jean-Pierre uh, was a whole other case because he, he was convinced. He said, Michigan is the best organized state you've got. If there's ever going to be a revolution, it's going to start in Michigan. Michigan. And uh, he, uh, but he, he was very disciplined. I mean, he would speak morning to night, television, radio, you know, anywhere. He was fabulous. But he was somewhat disgusted by some of the anti-war movement in this country who would, you know, be smoking dope at night and sleeping half the morning and mm -hmm. it's like, and mm -hmm. you know, he had, it was interesting comments. I'd get these phone calls and so the other thing that would happen with Jean-Pierre is young women would show up at the office looking for him, and sometimes their mothers. <laughs> he, was, he, had a, he, had some, he was charming and, uh, and delightful. And one day, you know, we're up on the third or fourth floor, I don't know which year that was, but in any case, this woman shows up, a uh, 20-year-old blonde in a fur coat, looking for Jean-Pierre Debris, she'd flown from Paris. Well, Jean-Pierre is in West Virginia, you know. <laughs> uh, but what do I do with her? She's got, it turns out she's got no money, she's got no place to go, she just knows where he, she thinks she can find Jean-Pierre. So I take, I, take, uh, I take him home to the S Street, and immediately the guys in the group house are totally smitten by her. <laughs> Catherine, they still, you ask Bob Minnick or Steve about Katrine. <laughs> anyway, Katrine. So one of the, in addition to these two huge 
exhibits that had been made to, to fit very compactly in the back of a VW van. Both of these vehicles were VW vans. Bands. And then there was another smaller one that we could ship if somebody ordered a, one to be shipped. And it also fit into a VW van, which we had uh, by this time. It was cased and it stood up in the floor to ceiling of the VW van if the bed were down. Uh -huh. So Jean-Pierre, uh, Katrine stuck around. And so the summer of 74, uh, Jean-Pierre is supposed to go to work with Tom and Jane, Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda, On and Peace speak campaign. with the Indochina Peace Campaign. And we're, we're going to go to California. Steve sometimes helped his dad with stuff, and we, we're driving this smaller exhibit to Denver, to the American Friends Service Committee office in um, Denver. And Jean-Pierre and Katrine laid down the entire way from LA, from PC to Denver. And Steve and our dog, Roland again, this dog, and uh, I in the front, we could never see them. But they would be back there arguing in French. Who is a Maoist? Who is an internationalist? Who is, it's like, it was the funniest thing. And so once we got to Denver, we unloaded this exhibit and uh, to, to Judy Danielson of the American Friends Service Committee. And they could, you know, the seat could go up and they could sit. And, uh, and then they decided they were going to get married. And I think we took them to the Grand Canyon and they decided they were going to get married uh, because they had learned. <laughs> uh, this was another issue on the road that, you know, if you told people you weren't married but you're sleeping together in 1973, mm -hmm. four, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, it was an issue. In fact, uh, I mean, when Jack, you know, Jackie met Roger on the road, he was a. It's Jackie Chignon and Roger Rumpfrew also with IMAP. Well, she was traveling with IMAP, and he was a UCC minister in Missouri doing the organizing. Yes. And. Uh, Anyway, pretty soon he's with IMEP. He's left <laughs> the ministry. He's with IMEP. Uh, uh, but they, at the, at the invitation of the Methodist Bishop of the Dakotas, the mobile project went to North Dakota, South Dakota. You know, all these nice Methodist farm families hosting. Mm -hmm. and, but they weren't married. I mean, like, say you are, whatever, but no. And so I was getting phone calls about this couple that was, you know, sleeping together and they weren't married. <laughs> and poor Bishop uh, Armstrong, you know, and McGovern, you know, was from there. And they, you know, it was, it was hard, hard on them and hard for me to deal with. But in any case, um, Jean-Pierre uh, <coughs> Jean Pierre and uh, his colleague wrote this book, and it was published by the Indochina Mobile Education Project. We accuse, Jacques uh, that's a term from the Dreyfus affair, I think, years ago. But in any case, he was, he was able to, um, he could say what he experienced and what he saw in the prison. And uh, this was very effective. And speaking of equipment, I, I'll never forget um, when Jane Barton of AFSC had a lot of pictures from Kuang Nai, where they were treating, they were doing physical therapy, which included some prisoners um, who had been shackled. And uh, the shackles were from Smith & Wesson. Mm of Springfield, Massachusetts, right, you know, right near, right, you know, where my family came from. Uh, it was... Well, one of the things about IMEP um, is that it did um, travel the, it founded in 1972, and it traveled around for the duration of the war, but you told me today that it also 
took on, after the end of the war, took on subsequent issues dealing with the war and traveled for another year. What, is, what are the issues that it uh, covered in 1976 before it folded up shop? Well, it, uh, that was really rough. I mean, I'm going to say something about the very end of the war. Um, do you remember the Assembly to Save the Peace Agreement at Georgetown? At Georgetown, yes. We were all there. So, yeah, we were all there. A couple thousand people were there. And uh, I met, was supposed to come up with a cafe with, um, you know, food and books and films and poetry readings and prisoner, uh, prisoners that you could adopt or something like that. And, I, you know, I went to the Mount Vernon, the women's college. Anyway, they had an auditorium for 700 and we began to realize, whoa, there are many more people coming to Washington for the assembly to save the peace agreement, which was put together by a coalition of, yeah. but IPC, I, IRC, the mobile project were all key to that. Um, and so Ralph Brave, my dear, wonderful, <laughs> uh, only other staff person at the time, uh, was a sometime student at Georgetown and he went from place to place trying to locate rooms at Georgetown. And amazingly, people would say, oh yeah, well our, our literature club is meeting, but no, of course, we'll give it over to you. And the uh, folk dance group would, <laughs> oh, no, of course, you can have it. And pretty soon, he had blocked all this, and pretty soon the university um, caught on. What is going on? I mean, you know, Suddenly, we were having this huge anti-war event taking place, and Ted Kennedy, I don't know who contacted Senator Kennedy, but he stepped in, and that's how it ended up at the... He stepped in in favor of it. In the favor of it, and, and the university allowed this to happen. And... But that meant, you know, coming, there was no food service, and there, around Georgetown there were no places to eat. <laughs> so coming up with a cafe became, um, I mean, I, this was a big thing. I, you know, so this is kind of wild. The S Street House is, we had Twa organizing a whole team chopping, boiling and chopping chickens in the basement and onions and so forth. And then on the second and third floor were boiling noodles and filling the tubs, these footed tubs with noodles. <laughs> it was like, and then we, we got sparkling new aluminum trash cans, put all, you know, put it all in. And we were, you know, the, this, this particular weekend, it was the anniversary of the peace agreement, so it was the very end of January bitter cold and freezing rain and and our ding door on our <laughs> car didn't work very well but in any case we had to keep it open carrying books and people and a trash can so we made these couple of trips carrying well, to Georgetown to Georgetown so you had to haul all this food, it, Vietnamese food over to the university yes, in these trash cans in the trash cans <laughs> <laughs> but for 2,000 uh, people yeah, at least. I forget what the actual number was. Oh, it, was it was a couple thousand. It was, was a couple huge. of thousand for sure. What and year? 75, January of 75. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, so then how do you, how do you keep it warm? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. These are the didn't practical spoil. things about being a peace we, activist, right? So, so we had these cinder blocks with little, um, electrical <laughs> hot plate <laughs> under these cans and the loading books and lo I mean the whole thing was just wild but unbeknownst to me I was pregnant mm -hmm. and unbeknownst to me this fetus was a victim of this slave labor mm. and, um, and I didn't know for some months that I yeah. was pregnant, and uh, it finally self-aborted the end of March. Mm -hmm. By this time, the war is really, you know, 
coming to a last close, stages. last stages. And um, so by the time the war ended, and I had been in New York uh, to convince clergy, and I'd been asked, you know, with the war ending, I would also should be organizing Calc to the Mid-Atlantic region. And Calc is clergy clergy and laity concerned, concerned originally yes. clergy and laymen concerned about the war in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, what? I mean, because Don, meanwhile, had ended up in New York at the Don head Luce. of that, which is how I ended up with so much of this responsibility. And um, so I was convincing Calc that I would do it on one condition, that Ralph would be my co would be co director. Ralph Brave. Yeah. Well, uh, and he's Jewish, and I am. I mean, he's nominally Jew. No, I mean, don't mean nominally, but he secular Jew, I guess. And I was Christian, and and I made the case. What could be better? You know, we would be this team. I would do it on that condition only. Well. Um, a few days later, I mean, the idea was Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda, you know, said, well, you know, some people will be in Washington to work in post-war issues, reconciliation. Some will go to the states and do local organizing. And Ralph looked at me one day and he said, Tom wants me to go to Santa Monica, to California. Ah, so there I was. But the, um, Jean-Pierre, I can remember him begging and begging and begging me to get in the car, my car, our car, our VW van, to go to New York for Sheep Meadow, Sheep's Meadow. Yes, the big to... celebration at the end of the big war. Big celebration. And I would have loved to have been there. I was just so sick. I was just, it mm. turned out that this um, situation, I, my, my system was poisoned. And... Uh, I couldn't go. And I can remember uh, John Kelly. Yes. He, he, you know, is Catholic. And he would, he really wanted to be on, um, is his name Casey? No, the head of the CIA. Colby. Colby. He, he, well, let, let me change this uh, thing. Let's pause a second. Yeah. So, yeah, um, John was in my office. Uh, I guess he, he volunteered some at the Indochina Resource Center, but I remember him being in the office and like every 20 minutes he would be on the phone calling Colby's house and demonstrating, and going to demonstrate outside of, you're, you're a Catholic? I mean, and how, how? Trying to get him excommunicated. Yeah. Trying, yes, <laughs> trying to get him excommunicated. <laughs> I remember that. Are we going again? Yeah. It was, uh, well, he, uh, that was, that was another thing about, but, so that summer, I was sick, but 75. I... 75. At 75, but I... Two things. I'm supposed to be starting, restarting Calc for the region, <laughs> and locally, and redoing some of the panels of the... For, to use after the war. For the post-war. So a lot of the cultural stuff, the political prisoner stuff, and all of that, but then we were, you know, things about veterans and, and Agent the reconciliation, was one of the Agent Orange, the defoliation, and um, reconstruction. And so the people who went on the road, two of them were, uh, one was a, Scot a Scottish woman and an American woman who had been with the Baby Lift mm -hmm. program, that the, and another one was uh, a guy who had been in Canada. I don't forget if he was a veteran or a not a veteran, but he'd been in Canada. Uh, As a resistor or a refuse, yeah. you mean? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, that was more difficult. There were fewer people ready to help yes. help do the local organizing and the money, you know, having any money to do it. It was an exhausting exhausting time. I mean, I was late to the peace movement, which was to my advantage because people were burning out yeah. left and right, and uh, I kept going. And then what happened, so in addition to the mobile project, 
I was active with Women's Strike for Peace. I um, was part of a committee for medical aid for Indochina, and we would have events at the house raising money for the Bakmai Hospital Fund. Yeah. Um, it seemed like there was just a Lots of dinners and events at your house with good Vietnamese food. Yeah, and there was always money. interesting people living there and sleeping on the couch and <laughs> all that. And one of the people that lived with you for you and Steve for a while was David Chong. I want to sort of end this interview talking a little about David, who died about a year ago. But can you um, tell so us David what, who David, David was and why he was important uh, in the anti-war movement? His yeah. name is Trundin Hung. David Trung, and he was a son of, of the man who was put in prison for challenging President Hu in the election mm -hmm. that I spoke of earlier. And he and... Um, David was from a very prominent Vietnamese family. A very prominent, yes. very wealthy family. And his father, he knew, you know, he was put into the best French high schools and mm -hmm. stuff. But David and some of these guys were, you know, they were agitating or resisting and getting in into Vietnam. trouble in their school. And, their fa and his father felt like he had to get him out of the country because they were, in Sa the Saigon government was imprisoning a lot of students mm -hmm. from like 1960 on. So David went to Stanford and then he he got involved in trying to lobby. I mean, his, his family knew, you know, the high, high-ranking Americans because they rented the houses in that na wealthy neighborhood. David did research, um, I forget the name of the organization. It was sort of like the Indochina Resource Center, but it was in Cambridge. Yes. When the war ended... What was the name of it? Uh, Vietnam Studies, I forget. With Novin Long. Absolutely. Novin Long was the, two the key person up there. In other they, were the, right. they were the two uh, key people for that office. And um, so when the war ended, he came to 1322 18th Street mm -hmm. to work with, to work on um, Post-war, yeah, and, post and diplomatic relations and all post -war of that sort issues of thing. between the U.S. and, and yeah. Vietnam. So um, I never forget this. I mean, I didn't really know David at that point. I didn't know about his background, but I can remember him. You know how filthy those stair the stairwell was. <laughs> I can remember uh, Gloria Emerson one day, the writer, standing on the stairwell with me. I mean, all this stuff. And she was waiting for Toi, and she said, Ah, oh, another day with the People's Army. <laughs> I never forgot it. I, I was driving them someplace in my, the VW van. But, um, uh, so there's this guy, you know, vacuuming, clean, sweeping the stairs and vacuuming. I mean, who is this guy? <laughs> Anyway, he, uh, and it turned out David was a very good cook. And David said, well, each of us had our own cook when we were growing up. We knew really good food, but the only way we could get it was to look to it ourselves here. So mm -hmm. he became a very good cook. Well, I, I, the, the story of how he was tracked, um, I guess I can't tell it very well right now, but uh, he's arrested. In fact, I was, I was in Santa Monica at, at Fred Brampton's and Trois, I probably shouldn't say that now, but yeah. So I was at their apartment and Roger called up and he said, turn the television on, David's been arrested. And there was the ambassador, the newly installed ambassador to the United Nations from Vietnam, Ambassador Din Bati, half the screen, David the other half of the screen. What? Um, anyway, that was a winter that Steve and I were actually living out there helping his family. And uh, we came back in March. Um, 
and David's in the Alexandria City Jail, and I am pregnant again. <laughs> and I went, I remember going to the Alexandria City Jail, so hot that summer, and there was just this little um, speaking hole or something. David, would you be the God <laughs> Father for my baby? Anyway, I got a letter from David, and he said, I, you know, I can't, I can't do that. I'll never have any money. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I said, this isn't about money or gifts. Mm -hmm. This is about character, and this is about courage, and blah, blah, blah. Well, then, you know how, I mean, he ended up eventually, um, his trial, he was, he was given a sentence five out of six. I think it was five out of six, 15-year um, concurrent mm -hmm. um, prison sentences. And uh, yeah, so well. my daughter ended up going to all three, the, all three federal prisons that he was in visiting him, and, uh... Hmm. Well, um, the end of our interview usually is when I ask you all these things that, that you did in the 60s and 70s that were so progressive and activist, how did those things affect the rest of your life? And in your and Steve's case, you've never stopped being peace activists, have you? Well, if that's the term, I'm not sure, but... <clears throat> What I didn't tell you was that um, I and the Vietnamese women had invited American women, like from Women's International League, Women's Strike yes. for Peace, and so forth, to go to Hanoi. And then the war ended sooner than they expected, anybody expected, including the Vietnamese. And so the idea was put on hold. So immediately after the war, there's so much to do, but then finally in 77, they reissued the invitation. Well, by then, I did, can't think of the names now, but the women that they were expecting to have come, you know, they've, they've got, they've doing other things, or Vietnam sort of not so much on their radar, and, and somebody called me and said, you know, somebody's got to go. Somebody has to go. Anyway, without that history, I mean, I was the, not the right person to go. I didn't have that history, but I went. You went. That so you really changed my life. And, and how did it change your life? Well, I, I, met, I met with some of the survivors of the prison and the tortures, and I met women who had been in the, in the mines, mining coal when the men were gone. I met... Um, uh, women who had been in the Coochie Tunnels. And I went, <laughs> fortunately, they said, Sally, get out of there, you're going to get stuck. I mean, now it's, they're opened up and they're now a big tourist attraction, but it's, I mean, it was one of the first foreigners to go into, but unfortunately I didn't, I got rescued from feeling like I had to go through <laughs> some long thing. But it was, um, but the weird thing was, the amazing thing was, this is December of 1977, and we think, um, you know, Carter's president, he, you know, we finally got the ambassador to the UN, we think the, it's all going to end. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it, di it didn't, <laughs> you know, the ambassador is, goes home, David goes to prison, um, the whole policy, mm -hmm. Carter's Secretary of State is replaced by, um, is it Brzezinski? I, um, Vance turns into Brzezinski. Yes, thank you. Vance. The ants turns into Brzezinski, and everything goes to hell from there. Cambodia. 
and Cambodia. Yeah. And so the women that I had seen um, are somehow they're getting, there's no mail, you know, direct mail, but somehow things were getting to me. And I would get these pictures of eviscerated women, mm -hmm. pregnant women on the Cambodian border. The Khmer Rouge had come over and, you know, were murdering people. And it's black and white pictures. What? What? I, Sally, do something. Do something. <laughs> anyway, um, something about that trip, too. Two things. One, I, I asked the question, when you were, when the war ended, what did you do? And the women in Ho Chi Minh City at the, said, well, we were at the edge of the city. And we kicked off, her, we, first we cried. Then we kicked off our shoes and ran as fast as we could to get down to the, to the embassy, U.S. Embassy. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting because my reaction when the war ended was to cry too. And I remember seeing Congressman Ron Dellums on television crying. And uh, so to hear them say, yeah, first we cried mm -hmm. and then we ran. <laughs> but the other question I remember asking is, what about the women's union in Cambodia? Because we're thinking, you know, they're, they're all friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ah, so naive. And, um, and I can remember this woman, it was just before Christmas. 77, and this woman said, there was a look on her face, just a look, and she said, well, we do it differently there. And it was the week before Vietnam broke relations. They had kept relations with Cambodia, hoping they could have some impact, and then they broke it right after, mm -hmm. right after Christmas, I think. But yeah, there was... Hmm. It's hard to put it all together. Well, thank you, Sally.